we move now from two women to an equally controversial, arguably even more controversial man. A.M. Now, is that man or woman? <laughs> what are their pronouns? A.M. asks, was Richard III a man of the people or a tyrant? Bearing in mind, very proper, he says, he sh they say, uh, bearing in mind he was a man of his time, as of course Richard was. Well, it so happens I've been doing quite a lot of work on this recently. I've got very interested in the person who is responsible for this, largely responsible for the verdict of Richard as a man of the people. There's a famous letter written uh, in the summer uh, of uh, 1483, uh, uh, after Richard, you know, has murdered his nephews, which 99.999% certainly has done, or at least bears directly responsibility, direct responsibility for it. And he goes on a progress in the north of England, where, of course, he'd held power under his brother. He'd had a great palatinate centred on Middleham Castle that stretched over the whole of the north of England. It was a kind of devolved government. And Richard always remains very popular in the north, and especially in the capital of the north, uh, York. And Richard, uh, in the summer after he sees the throne, goes on a great progress there. And one of the people accompanying him who writes the famous letter which says that he's never seen any king do so much for the people. The man who writes that letter is um, he's 40 odd years old, I suppose. He's a highly promising um, academic uh, come churchman. He, he's called Thomas Langton. Um, he's at this point um, the Bishop of St. David's. He will become Bishop of Salisbury uh, and he will finish his career as being elected under Henry VII to the Archbishopric of Canterbury, but he only holds it I think even for a few days um, before he dies of the plague um, uh, and and is never, of course, uh, installed or uh, as archbishop or consecrated. Now, Thomas Langton is a remarkable figure. He's is middle Tory, begins at Cambridge. He's a northern boy like me. Uh, he's born near Appleby, in Appleby actually, which is a few miles from where I was born in Kendal. Goes to Cambridge like me, and then unlike me, he spends the middle of his academic career entirely in Italy. Um, at Bologna and and Padua uh, and and a few a little time in Rome as well. The this these great universities because they were at that time they were the best universities in Europe, much better or more interesting than Paris or Oxford. Uh, they were where the cutting edge of the new studies in Renaissance texts. He's a lawyer uh, in canon law in medicine um, uh, and of course uh, in developing classical literature. Uh, they're also centres of the book trade and printing, and you can see uh, uh, printing largely in, in actually in Venice and Rome itself. But the book the books are sold, and you can see Langton uh, in these years buying books, acquiring manuscripts, and filling his head with the new ideas of politics that are derived directly from well derived directly from Rome, principally from the Roman Republic. And his head then is stuffed with notions of res publica, of commonwealth, of the public interest, of the duty of everybody uh, from the head of state, the king himself, to the merest, to merest humblest subject to work for some form of collective good. And he returns, Langton returns to England, He's got good patronage. He returns to England uh, in the 1470s and um, he rises rapidly in the service of uh, Richard's brother, uh, Edward IV, um, and he finds himself in the position of a favourite king's clerk. He's working with Edward as a major diplomat and also within the heart of the royal household. And the thing that excites me as somebody who is basically a historian of the royal court um, is that um, Langton is responsible for the revised household ordinances of Edward's reign, uh, famously 
the Black Book, his involvement in that isn't entirely clear, but in the, the Household Ordinances of 1478, it is absolutely clear. He is responsible for carrying them to the Lord Chancellor uh, to be formally enacted. And uh, I think the, 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 the text that we have is actually in his hand. It's a very unusual hand. It's not at all like an ordinary English hand or the hand of, of a regular clerk of the royal household. And I think it's him who invests this household ordinance, a regulation as to, you know, how the king is to uh, run the court, run his domestic life. It's him who invests this with this high rhetoric about, uh, you know, avoiding extravagance on the one hand and meanness on the other and taking a careful middle road that will benefit his subjects, um, the, the, in other words, the Aristotelian mean, because this is what he actually believes in. But of course, what he saw in Edward was something very different. Edward IV, I'm afraid, as would become the case in Henry VII, Edward IV's government turns into an exercise of pure selfishness. The king sees his interest as merely being to make himself as rich and therefore as powerful as possible. Now, what I think Richard does, he picks up these new ideas. He picks up this call for, if you like, a moralised government. He's very, Richard, very aware of morality. He's very formally religious, I think, seriously religious. We know he has a Franciscan confessor. We know he has a particular prayer and so on that he uses. So he picks up these ideas of, if you like, political morality. And he makes a very great play of them. Of course, he charges his brother with gross immorality himself after his brother is safely dead. And he uses the charges of his brother's womanizing to, 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 to bastardize his children, um, uh, in particular the two boys who stood between him and the throne. And it seems to me to be clear that Langton believes him. But should we believe Langton? Should we believe Langton? He's a fellow northerner. He, Richard is showering vast patronage on Cambridge. Langton, I'm afraid, is an insider. If you look at Richard's behaviour, it is as selfish, as destructive, and above all, as bloody as everybody else. Because I'm afraid, in the circumstances of the late 15th century, it was very difficult to see what a public interest in government was. The government was the king's. The only possible public interest in it was keeping some sort of order on the principle that it's better to have one you know, big oppressor rather than a lot of little ones all feuding together. So I'm afraid my verdict of Richard is that not only is he really every bit as nasty as he is presented as being, he is, for very obvious reasons, a hypocrite as well. Now, why am I so confident about Richard's nastiness? Because people at the time thought so. Everybody took, apart from Langton and the other insiders of the regime, everybody took for granted that he had murdered his nephews. The story is general even by the turn of Christmas at 1483-1484. That was taken for granted. Otherwise, how do you account for the fact that Richard is king for barely two years and that as insignificant and improbable a candidate, backed by the French for heaven's sake, as Henry VII is able to win? at Bosworth, when the great bulk of the aristocracy simply stand aside. Once again, as you can tell, this is a topic I'm really excited by, particularly because of Langton, because of these questions, again, of values in government. You know, I love the soap opera of history, as I often say, but equally, the period of the Tudors is a moment of real crisis in ideas, the ideas of what is the purpose of government. Um, so, I will be exploring these again, so we'll do a video, as I've said, on Mary. We'll also do one very soon on this 
battle of ideas that is the foundation of Tudor England and really runs right through this extraordinary period of the recess of English power, um, English, remember, English power between the loss of the Hundred Years' War and the civil wars of the 17th century and is only reversed with the glorious revolution of 1688-89 and the vast series of victories against the French in the 18th century, um, beginning really uh, with Blenheim but going on through the Seven Years' War. So all that is to come. Hello and thank you for watching David Starkey Talks. If, as I very much hope, you're enjoying them, why not become more actively involved and join my Members Club? As a member, you'll be able to take part in the members-only weekly question and answer session, suggest topics for forthcoming videos and have priority booking for my forthcoming live events. And while you're at it, why not have a look at the store page on my website davidstarkey.com. There you can purchase t-shirts and other merchandise, buy signed copies of my books and, if you're feeling brave and a bit flush, even arrange to take me out to lunch. Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to hearing from you and to welcoming you to my Members Club.